Good morning. Welcome to St. Margaret's Meditation for today, Sunday, the 27th of December, 2020, nearly at the end of the year. Our reading for today, Our reading for today comes from Luke, chapter 2, and verses 22 to the end of that uh, chapter, at uh, the end of that section, um, verse 40, 20, 22 to 40. Jesus presented in the temple. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrate, consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of, of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with the wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Amen. Luke was the beloved physician, quote, who accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys. He was with him when he was imprisoned in Caesarea Philippi and then accompanied him to Rome, where Paul was imprisoned again and later executed. Luke was Greek in origin and would have been trained after the style of Hippocrates, who lived 400 years before him. Hippocrates is justly famous as a genius who rescued medicine from the sort of witch doctrine mixed with primitive religion that was current at the time. He basically invented the scientific approach to medicine, which is the basis of modern medicine. He was famous in his own day and traveled widely around the Greek world teaching 
in many, med in many medical centres. Luke would have been taught after the fashion of Hippocrates and would have been a well-educated man. So that when he says in verse 3, I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you, we can be sure of the account of a very orderly and assiduous mind. What more could we expect of a doctor? And the style of his writing is lucid in the Greco-Roman literary style. That is, apart from the first two chapters, excluding the verse mentioned above, the first two chapters, which appear to be of Hebrew origin. And it has been suggested that Luke was so enchanted by these writings, which he may have seen when he was in Caesarea, that he decided to include them at the beginning of his gospel. And they, they include the Benedict, the magnificent Benedictus and the Magnificat, which we use in our services regularly. And that he decided to use them because he was so impressed by them. And he interpolated them at the beginning of his gospel, not quite at the beginning, but just after the first two or three verses. But I suspect that he might have had the idea to include them, not just because they were poetical and beautiful, but in order to emphasize the Jewishness of Jesus. As an aside here, I might say that there are, in Christianity, some elements of superiority or slight dismissiveness about the Jewish religion, which amount almost to anti-Semitism and are offensive. Jesus was born of Jewish parents into a Jewish society and grew up as a Jew. He preached as a Jew and he died as a Jew. And Luke was not going to let us forget that fact. What Jesus preached was a complete reinterpretation of the law and the prophets which the Jewish authorities of the day resisted and saw as anti-Jewish and subversive, but which, of course, it was not. We come now to our text for today, which was set in the temple in Jerusalem, where Joseph and Mary, carrying the tiny six-week-old Jesus, were attending for the ceremony of purification and the presentation of their male firstborn to the Lord, as was the custom. In the temple, they met Simeon, an example of a deeply religious man who, moved by the Spirit of the Lord, came to the temple at that time, on that day. He must have come on many days, but on this day he encountered the Holy Family. And can you imagine the amazement and almost disbelief when this happened? And it would seem to me that the Spirit of the Lord encompassed them all in a passionate and loving bubble. Why else would Joseph and Mary hand over their, to his embrace uh, their firstborn and very precious son? Simeon must have been so well versed in the scriptures and so open to the spirit that he was immediately able to recognize the Messiah. He and Anna represented the true Judaism over and against that of the temple authorities of the day. God had promised him that he would not die until he had had this experience, and so grateful was he that he felt now he could die. God's promise to him had been fulfilled, as they had been to the Jews 
throughout the Old Testament. And here we have his prayer of deep gratitude, which we know by its Latin name for the dunk, Dimittis. Now you can dis dismiss me. But he goes on to recognise also that Jesus was to be no military warrior nor a powerful earthly king, but that this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Wow, how on the ball was that? And then Anna, a prophetess, came on the scene and reflected Simeon's prophecy and gave thanks to God and was in fact Christ's first missionary when she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Then the family of Jesus returned to Nazareth where grace, the grace of God was upon Jesus and then there they were back again in their humble home within their own Jewish community. Throughout the history of the Hebrews from Abraham onwards there is a deep undercurrent of which we are always aware but which surfaces sometimes more powerfully than others and often with phrases like the spirit of the Lord came upon came upon him it's usually a hymn they were rather patristic but it was sometimes hair and I guess underneath it was him and hair at about equal if not more hair it happened with Gideon it happened with King Saul and with Isaiah just just to name three And here we have it, in the temple, with Simeon and Anna, the spirit had come upon them. When it happened in the Old Testament, great things happened, amazing things happened. The Israelites were delivered from overwhelming hordes or delivered from slavery or from exile. And now in the temple, we have the penultimate prophets of the Old Testament, Simeon and Anna. John was the ultimate, John the Baptist. And they were being used by the Spirit to herald the Messiah, the ultimate amazing thing. In some cases, the Spirit's activity in the Old Testament seems to be an episode. In other cases, as with John the Baptist, it was a lifelong presence, starting with his stirrings in the womb when Mary came to visit Elizabeth. But in the case of Jesus, of course, it was the Spirit itself who conceived him. The pattern builds up to a crescendo throughout the Old Testament, and then here was the uniqueness of the Incarnation. What, we, what can we learn from our lesson today? That the Spirit of the Lord is the dominant major keynote of the symphony of creation, maintaining and renewing and bringing it to its fruitful climax. That the Spirit blows where it wishes and often empowers the most unlikely of people. That its power is irresistible and generative and passionately loving. That prayerful and devout and humble people like Simeon and Anna can be the prophets. That in Jesus the Spirit became embodied, and that is what we have celebrated in Advent. 
that the Messiah breaks the mould. That the establishment will likely resist it. That within ourselves, our ego establishment does resist it. That the quiet and watchful contempla contemplation of people like Simeon and Anna will be conduits for the spirit. That here and now in a church that has been humbled by God, as the Hebrews were on many an occasion, the spirit is at work. And I don't know if you saw the BBC news item about two weeks ago, uh, and then it was uh, there was another item on the 18th of December about Pastor Mick Fleming and Father Alec, Alex Frost of St Matthew's Anglican Church in Burnley, working with the down and outs, when they each, during their separate interviews for TV, wept at the plight of so many people, and how and how viewers since the, the spirit here, how viewers since have sent in an amount which comes to £250,000, the spirit at work. Many other challenges we face for the future, but as of old, and especially in the light of the Christ child, we can be sure of the guidance and the strengthening presence of the Holy Spirit with us. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, as the last line in Matthew's Gospel says. Amen. Now keep well, keep distancing, keep careful until we meet again. Amen.